This is it. Another night in the darkness as we face our fears and look dead into the eyes of the Black Eyed Kids. Gemma Jade is back. Her new book, Midnight Visitors, True Stories of Black Eyed Kids is out and available. There's a link for it on today's program guide. So buckle up, turn down the lights, get close to the speakers. Things are about to get freaky right here on the very best in paranormal programming. I'm Dave Schrader and welcome to my Paranormal 60. I'm not going to stand here and listen to this baloney. He won't know. He doesn't stand for baloney. Sounds like a lot of supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural. Perhaps. Maloney, perhaps not. Thank you to all tuning in from around the world. We're a little late tonight because, well, for those of you watching the program, I just got back from a cruise out to Cozumel, Mexico. That's right. I went out with my family. We went and had a nice little four or five day getaway and went to Cozumel where I took an extraordinary uh, little side trip once we were there to go to some of the Mayan ruins and get a chance to see them for myself and get to hear about the legend and lore and folklore stories of the Mayan culture. And it was really, really powerful. It was great to hear these cool stories and kind of get some insights into how some of these um, different religious beliefs and spiritual elements come to life in foreign areas and things you think you thought you knew, you realize you weren't even close. And it is so cool to get this chance. So I recommend, man, if you get a chance when you're out, whether it's in another state or another country, wherever you may be traveling to, dip into the culture. Try to find somebody, a native of that area, that can maybe talk you through some of the more rich tapestry and history of these locations. It was just so great to get a chance to go out and actually interact with the people and hear their stories firsthand. And one of the, I, I thought, and, and we'll get into the show in just a few minutes, but I thought it's interesting since we're talking about folklore and we're, we're talking about strange beings and things that are, are, are all over, right? Where it comes to strange supernatural forces, um, hearing some of the ideals behind the culture and the trees. And I didn't realize this, that many of the Mayan temples would only be built to the to the top of whatever their highest tree was. They would never go above that. Um, and that the trees represented uh, many different elements. The roots were going to the underworld. The middle was, was life. And then the tops of the trees, of course, uh, evolving into the afterlife or into the uh, great unknown. And it was just so cool to hear the way the culture uh, reflected on their surroundings so much and knew about how to use the land and and chart the skies and the stars. And you hear that all of these cultures from around the world could do these same things, but how did they all know it? Like almost simultaneously. Makes you really do believe that there was some kind of internet in the past, some kind of ethereal internet that interlocked us in a way that is so far from where we are now so distracted by the technologies that we hold and and have to check every 15 minutes to see if we've got another like or another view and and it really kind of saddens my heart because i realize when these cultures were the strongest is when they were all together and when they taught and they worked and they stood side by side and they told these tales uh, and and experienced these moments, and they were so cued into each other and not something else that they could do remarkable things under extraordinary circumstances, areas that should not grow food or pro provide them with waters, things that they desperately needed would still be there for them. And it was interesting that many of the religious concepts of, of the Mayan culture, according to the people we spoke to and that were leading us on this tour, told us about the fact that a lot of these structures, uh, the, meaning the religious structure, was predicated on 
listen, the wealthy, the church, if we do this right, right? Cocoa is superior. Everybody wants the cocoa beans. So you have to give it to the church. We'll keep an eye on it. We'll take care of it so that the elders and the church leaders would have the best cocoa, have the best everything brought to them. And uh, in a sense, they were using the gods as a way to manipulate people to bring them things and give them the power which I see in, in religious cultures across the world and wonder how much of that. Yet there was something miraculous about the fact of coming together with a common belief and idea that it could bring life to situations. And I think that's a lot about what we're going to discuss this evening because, again, the beings, the black-eyed kids, it's kind of a, a haunting folklore. It's one of those stories that seems to get whispered and passed amongst different families and has gone by different names. I've heard new things, the hollow children, the hollow children with the black eyes, hollow meaning in what sense? And from some of the different religious perspectives means without soul, which would again play into the concept of these dark black eyes, the fact that there is no soul. There's nothing, there's no spark of actual life or real consciousness behind it. It's almost like the avatar has somewhat come to life. If you remember in some of the old video games, you'd have the avatar and it would, it would, even though you weren't moving, it would continue to kind of walk around and bump into things. And it, it's like it kind of existed without you. And, and it makes me wonder how much of these black eyed kids stories, these hollow children, and other folklores that are very similar in nature uh, follow that same vein, that they're beings that are there that are not that powerful, but then from time to time we remember them. They come back to the foreground of our consciousness, which seems to empower them, give them strength, and they start becoming more prevalent. People are seeing them across the world. And that's what surprised me most about doing the work that I do and hearing the stories of the black eyed kids is that at first we looked at this culture as though it was something, this, this strange fable was nothing more than urban legend until people from around the world and different cultures and different belief systems and different levels of humanity in those areas all had stories that surround iterations of these same beings. And now they've come back to life. There's been new consciousness breathed into them because of the fears of the people that share these stories and have these experiences. Is it truly that they're seeing these beings or are they projections from the other side? Are they projections from a consciousness somewhere else trying to find a way into our world? I don't know. I love the black eyed kid phenomenon. I think part of the reason I love it so much is because there is no hard and fast rules for a while. We believe the hard and fast rule was they could not enter your home, could not enter your car, uh, could not gain access to you without your permission. Yet we started to hear more and more stories of people that found themselves face to face with these beings in their own home following them into places that we would feel safe and secure. So they don't seem to follow legend and lore, unless perhaps the legend and lore is the ones that you believe in. And maybe that would be an interesting element of this, is as we hear these stories, to push more into the nature of those that have had experiences with the Black Eyed Kids, where the story seems to go beyond what we've heard before, is it because of the beliefs of the experiencer? Because the experiencer doesn't hold the same belief systems of not allowing things in, believing that things could just attach to them by passing their way, crossing their, their paths somewhere like a black cat allows them onto you. It's interesting. And I'd love that, you know, if you have concepts on this, if you have ideas about this, email me, Dave at paranormal60.com, because I'd love to hear from you our listeners. But right now, let's turn some focus to our returning guest. She was with us a little over a month ago with her first book coming out. The new book is out and available called Midnight Visitors, True Stories of Black-Eyed Kids. Gemma Jade, the author, she is our friend. 
and she is here to share and regale us with more strange stories of black eyed kids. Gemma, welcome back to the show. Hello, thank you for having me. What do you think about this concept that that these beings are always there until we start to recognize them and give them that ability to kind of come back to life? And that's what gives these things and emboldens them, gives them strength to start being seen again. I believe there definitely could be something to that because in all of the research I did for years, I there were like maybe sometime in right before, so I'd say the 80s, I guess the 80s, mm -hmm. I was going to say before the 90s, um, there was this like decade where they really weren't, there were almost no reports anywhere. I mean, there were some scattered, but then you get into the nineties, still not too much. And then Brian Bethel, the journalist comes out and is the first one, as far as anyone knows, to put it on a blog. Then mm -hmm. all of the sudden the sighting started. And that's why a lot of people th thought for a long time, it was an urban legend, but I think it just put it into the minds of people. So one, they're more aware Two, I don't think the BEK are tulpas, but I do think there's some tulpa energy there where, like you said, if they're, if someone is focused on it or if someone is now aware of it, they have a much higher chance of bringing it to them. And I also feel like it's not so much that we're seeing them more in, in a lot of cases, it's that we're more easily able to share it now. You know, I got a call and, and I was reminded of this recently when we first began talking about the black eyed kids uh, and bringing it out and we were kind of, you know, half of it's tongue in cheek, half of it's totally freaked out by this, this being right. I got a phone call one night on my cell phone from an unknown number. And uh, remember when we used to get those unknown number or unknown yeah. <laughs> right, caller. So I, I answered the phone. I'm like, hello, this is Dave. And the only voice I got, it was, it didn't sound like a child to me. It sounded like a man. And he goes, uh, some of us, how did he put it? It was something along the lines of your black eyed kids stories. Some of us grow up and we still have the black eyes. And then he hung up Ooh. and that was it. And I, I was like, chills. right. Oh. And, and what's really strange to me was that of probably two, three, four weeks later, I started getting emails from different people saying, does anybody ever talk about the black eyed adults? Because I think I've had encounters with them. And I was like, that's really weird. As soon as my consciousness became alerted to that, right. The mnemonic trigger, I call it right. The, the fact that like you buy a specific car, you don't notice that car until you own it. And then all you see is that car because yeah. your brain recognizes a pattern. Now that I've had somebody awaken in me, the concept that black eyed adults exist. And I was like, what the, and, and then I started hearing tales of these beings, these black eyed adults, but most of us automatically ascribe that to being more in the demonic realm. Whereas the black eyed kids, they have this foreboding sense, this kind of weird, evil malevolence, but a lot of people stop short from calling them a demon, Gemma. Yeah. Is that a fair assessment that people will say they feel dark or they feel threatened, but they don't feel like it's demonic in nature. Very much. Yeah. That's that very much makes sense because I always say, I don't really believe that they're demonic mainly because demons have their own way of appearing as small children without the black eyes and the whole song and dance. And that's kind of what sealed the deal for me um, with them not being demonic, but yes, that makes perfect and total sense because there's just so much to it, you know, and it's really right. hard to weed out what what doesn't fit because the minute I'm like, okay, this isn't a part of that, this isn't a part of the BEK. The next thing I know, I have 12 encounters of everything I just thought wasn't going to be a part of it. And it was hard to write these two books back to back, especially the just encounters, the midnight visitors, because again, every time I was like, okay, this this probably isn't a real story because I haven't seen that, you know, haven't seen that before. And, and then all of a sudden I'm bombarded with tales of the same exact thing happening that I just thought might not be true because I had never heard it before. Right. And that's what was so strange <laughs> to me is people, it's like once we name the beings, once they become part of the yeah. lexicon, I don't know if it awakens in people memories, maybe some were suppressed memories, some that 
I had the memory. I just didn't know what to call them, but you're right. Black eyed kids, black eyed children, that fits it exactly They're You know, it's so simplistic in nature, but then people feel for, you know, that they can come forward and discuss this. And of course there's a, there is a, a swath of the public that will tell you fake stories because they want to be. Yeah. They want to be a part of it. History. And so it's, you know, then it, it, it gets tough sifting through the stories of what do we believe is real? What do we believe is not? And, uh, you know, when it comes to these creatures, what's impressed me is when I've spoken to somebody and, and I've said this before, there's been a few military personnel that I've spoken to yeah. where my grandfather served in world war two. He was a paratrooper. He made four of the five major drops. Um, this guy was balls to the wall, brave. Right. And he was full of life and just an amazing human being. And when he would talk to me about the war, you could almost see the light go out in his eyes. And as it was, I, I don't know how else to explain it other than he was wherever he was, you know, telling me the story. He wasn't sitting there before me telling me yeah. a story. He was there in that moment, reliving the experience. And when I've spoken to some of, not all of them, and, and a lot of the ones that I haven't shared are for that reason that, and I don't want to be judgy, but it's like, oh yeah, I saw this and it was this and they were, and it, it just feels You're not like getting excited no, about it. yeah, there's no, well, I, I know people react differently too. So it's hard yeah. for me to say that, but when it, there's no connectivity to it, it's not like it, it impacted them in any certain way. It's traumatic. Um, Right. It's, it's Regardless. almost traumatic or it's, okay. it, it's like my experience with UFOs. I saw what I saw and I know what I saw. And if I talk to you about it, I think you'd see that same kind of glaze effect as I'm going mm -hmm. back into the memory of it. And, but it's, it's almost doesn't feel like it's real. It feels like I'm remembering a TV show from a childhood or, or, yeah. a you know, somebody else's memory. So it's really kind of weird the way our brains try to shield and protect us from things mm -hmm. that unnerve us. And, and that's what I found really interesting is seeing some of these people share their stories with me. And I'm not looking for telltale signs of lies and that they're looking up and to the right or up and to the left, you know, the, the way they teach you on the CSI TV yeah. show to <laughs> tell if you're lying. I, I'm more intrigued by the way that they share the experience and you could see that it's more than just a story it's something that's manifested within the person it's a tactile expression uh, they smell it taste it feel it they they're there again yeah and that's hard to just say this is guys just trying to you know hone in on on a popular culture i totally right understand now. there there's just this I don't know. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but it is hard to put words to it when you're speaking to, and I, I call them victims. I refer to people who have encounters as victims or witnesses, but I refer to them as victims because all every single one of them across the board, whether they're a little excited about being able to have an experience, if they're really into the paranormal or not, they're all very traumatized by the encounter. And I feel like when I say the BEK are energetic feeders, and I'm sure of that, I don't know how mm -hmm. I'm sure, I guess just through all the research, it's just something I've come to understand as fact, they're energetic feeders, regardless of whatever else they are. And I feel like they've, they've taken a part of the person of the victim with them, regardless of whether or not they were let in some, there's some disconnect there, or there's something that I believe the BEK are taking from their victims energetically, but it lasts much more long-term than slamming the door in their face or right. God forbid inviting them in. It almost feels like you kind of let them in by t sharing the story. You didn't have to let them cross the threshold. They still got in, they got into your mind. They got into who you are. I had a woman here in Minnesota at one of the uh, mind, body, spirit expos, whatever, you know, I can't remember. There are many different iterations of that title, uh, but she came up and she's just this sweet, petite, little old lady. And she just reached her hands down and put them on top of mine. And she said, I listened to your show 
and they're very fun and entertaining. But you keep talking about those black eyed children. And I can tell you from experience, you don't want to keep talking about them because they're going to hear you and they're going to know that you have an interest and that's what they want. And I said, oh, have you had an experience? And she said, I will not open that door again and I will not talk about it. But I'm going to tell you, be careful because it's real. And if you keep discussing it, you might open up your, your own life to some horrors that you can't even begin to imagine. And, you know, it's tough because I want to respect her you know, wishes of not going further, telling me the story, but it's kind of like, well, that was a weird warning kind of out of the blue. So I've, you know, I've walked that line of how much of this do I let in? How much do I allow to affect and impact me? And I, I love a good ghost story. I love a good creepy tale that gets into your head and makes you think about it. But is that what they're hoping for long run is to have that kind of the claws sunk in and that it does become part of your fear factor. And you brought up something earlier. Uh, It's much like the character of Pennywise from it. It takes, does it take, do do these beings take on um, the visage of what frightens us? And when it realizes you know, back in the day, aliens weren't bulbous head, big black eyes. They were humanistic looking. And then Whitley Strieber's book Communion came out and we saw that cover. Yeah. And suddenly more and more stories started to appear of that. Now, does that mean more people were awakened to that and remember, oh my God, I've seen that? Or did darkness start to take that For, look? Yeah. And now that we talk about the black eyed kids, are we not tulpa izing them as in we've created them ourselves but are we giving form to our fears are we allowing that energy of fear that exists around us at all times to find a home find a way to latch onto something that they know can affect you that's so interesting i you know, when you put it that way, it actually does make sense. And I recently was discussing, someone had brought up earlier the MIB in the comments somewhere. And I was doing a video and I was discussing whether or not the MIB, the BEK, the WIB, Shadow Entities, Hatman, all of these dark quote unquote entities, whether or not they're all the same thing that just takes on a different form based on something, something with your energy, something based in your fear set. When I wrote Danger at Your Door, which is the first book I did and Midnight Visitors is the companion to that, which we discussed last time I was on your show, I actually wrote in the introduction, I believe, about how I was afraid. And it took me much longer to write that book than it did any of my previous three Mm -hmm. because I was afraid that I was going to call them to me. And I'm really not afraid of much. I actually enjoy most encounters, even if they're, you know, terrifying, because I love, I don't know, I I just love it. I love to explore and research and learn and ooh, what's that? Yeah, that's terrifying. What is that? You know, but the BEK are something that I am absolutely more than terrified of bringing anywhere near me. And I always have been since the moment I first saw an episode featuring them on a television show, but I've also been overtly obsessed ever since that moment. I don't think there was a time that went by, you know, an entire week in the last 11 years that I didn't think about them at least twice and look something up about them at least once. So you know, I, I get it. And I, I do understand that because I was just discussing that. Is it just all darkness? I tend to believe they're interdimensionals because of some things when we discuss um, encounters later, I'll mention, but there is that part of me that's like, you know, what are the odds that like all these things are suddenly just popping up and that they're real right. in all these different forms? Quick question from the audience here. Uh, Jane asks, is the book going to be in the UK? And what's the price on the book? Please, Dave or Gemma, please answer. That's what Jane wants to know. Is the book going to be available through Amazon over in the UK? Um, I really don't know. I would have to get back to you on that. If you want to email me, I can definitely give you an answer on that. And it is $8.99 for the book. Very cool. We have a link for that book on today's program as well so that you can find that. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, check into your Amazon. I, I, we're working on that as well with my book. Uh, I definitely will. Yeah, because I have a lot of subscribers across the pond too. So very cool. All right, um, let's let's start talking about some of the stories now. You're again for people that might have missed your interview last month. Tell us the title of of the book that came out a little over a month ago. Danger at your door: Terrifying encounters with black eyed kids. And that is the research legend. That's all of the research behind that. All the thoughts, theories, speculation, ideas, facts throughout the ages from what I can find. Midnight Visitors is encounters only. Because right. I know when I read a book, I go right for the encounters and then I go back for the rest. So I was like, all right, let's do some encounters too. Some more encounters. And in my new book, Theater of the Mind, Tales from the Darkness, we do include one of my favorite black-eyed kid encounters. And mm -hmm. I'll be sprinkling my black-eyed kid stories throughout uh, my books as well so that we've got a little taste of everything in them. But I love when people come together and we'll, we'll put together these books that are really uh, comprehensive on, on the black-eyed kids. Um, so what story do you want to give us here before we go to our first break, Gemma? What's, what's a good encounter that really kind of you find that super unnerving. Oh my gosh, there are so many. And there are a lot that are happening at military bases. And I believe I talked about the one last time with the Apple. And I get like flustered because I have so many in my head. Okay, so I'll bring one up that happened in the middle of the woods. And this is happening more and more. A man or it was a woman, she was camping overnight. She was a photographer of sorts and she was a freelance and she was trying to take pictures of landscapes and beautiful nature out in the mountains in the middle of the forest in the middle of nowhere. And she went into an isolated spot that was technically off limits in a national park. I don't know how she got in, but she wanted to take pictures and show that she was risky. I don't know, really know what her deal was. She had been a photographer her whole life. She was looking to get back into it. And, um, she spent the night um, overnight in the woods and she was by herself. There were no people around because it was an area you weren't supposed to be in. So when she was hearing walking around, she was assuming it was some sort of animal, some sort of, you know, something. And she just decided to go into her tent and go to sleep. The very next day, she decided to snap pictures she had thought she had seen some image of a humanoid or a human standing near a tree, but it looked all in shadow and she got really freaked out. She thought about snapping her, her camera and she was like, you know what? I'm just going to pretend I don't see it and go in and, you know, hope everything's okay. The next day she wakes up and she looks over and she doesn't see anything that could have made that shape. So she's a little freaked out, but she's like, I've got these pictures to take. She gets to a very even more isolated part of the woods. And she made it very clear to tell me many times she was nowhere, you know, day like days hikes away from her vehicle and all this and, and civilization, other people. And as she's looking through the lens, she sees a little dot that kind of looks like it could be a person across like very far away from her, maybe two foot two football fields um, length away. And she's kind of looking, she's wiping her lens off. And then she sees it closer and she sees that it looks like a small human being, like a child. She takes her eye out of the camera to look again. She still sees it looks like a little child, but she can't really see it. The next thing she knows, she looks through the lens again, and there is a black eyed child. This is broad daylight in the middle of nowhere. No one will hear you scream. And she jumps, she screams, she looks. And when she looks around the camera, sure enough, there's a BEK there. And the BEK, BEK said to her, we don't like image takers. And she said, I turned and ran and left all of my equipment, everything there, ran till I couldn't run anymore and was terrified to camp out. And I heard walking and I saw the same small humanoid shadowy images leaning against trees all night long, but I was too afraid to even aim a flashlight at them. I just wanted to get the heck out of there. And she is one of maybe a handful of photographers who have had an experience with the BEK and the BEK make mention of not liking photo takers, photographers, or image takers. Interesting, huh? Don't, and, and again, there is the old uh, legend and folklore behind taking photographs that you're yes. stealing a piece of the soul, um, you know, and, and maybe these beings don't want proof or 
are they? Because we don't see much video footage. There's really no video footage or photographs, no. uh, not even ring videos. And that's been one of the stories. I've had a few of the people that have reached out to me telling me with my ring camera, Dave, we had this encounter. And when I went back to the ring camera, you can hear us talking and you can hear us at the front door and there's nobody talking back to us and there's yes. no image of these kids. So yep. again, that starts fitting into the demonic vampiric kind of concept or construct of of these beings something just kind of struck me and I, I i apologize Gemma. i don't remember if you covered this in your first book okay. but um we know the power that water holds with the paranormal yes i wonder if the black-eyed kids might be the souls of children who lost their lives in drownings because uh, there's an image, there's a famous image of this young um, girl kind of clinging to a branch and uh, it was during a flood. They were trying to save her. They ended up saving her, but she passed soon after, but her eyes had turned black and it was from the immersion in the water for a long period. And, you know, it just kind of struck me and I'm like, boy, wouldn't that be something? Because we do know how uh, the power of water seems to embolden some supernatural spirits. If oh, yeah. <laughs> our children that drowned, and that would actually fit really, uh, boy, I almost wish I could go back and, and put that concept in for the, the book that I just released, because um, I, I share a story about a, a girl by water who keeps trying to get the couple to join her. And uh, they it was a black-eyed kid oh. experience. So... I wonder if these if these being spirits might have something to do with drowning. That is crazy. I'm going to look into that because I it, I never made the connection. I have said maybe they are kids who are missing or murdered in the woods, you know, centuries ago, and that's what mm -hmm. the clothing. And but I never made the water connection. But it makes just as much sense as anything else we know. And I haven't heard that yet. That may be an original um, theory there, Dave. Wow. I Yeah. <laughs> I've had I an original, original idea. Let me jot that down. Today, <laughs> I'm already I on it. I'm for taking myself. Notes. Yeah, that's great. Um, interesting. Well, I'll tell you what, folks. In my book, I'm working on the audio book now. So hopefully when I release it uh, and within the next 30 to 45 days, I plan on doing a little bit of more talk on each story, not just the stories, but giving you a little bit more. So maybe we'll cross that bridge on that as well. We do need to take just a very short break. We'll come back. We'll discuss more with our guests. And remember to get it, get the book. Uh, there's a link for it on today's program guide, Midnight Visitors, True Stories of Black-Eyed Kids. Gemma Jade, our guest, when we return right here on the very best in paranormal programming, I'm Dave Schrader. And this is the Paranormal 60. All right, I've heard you. You want me to come down south? I'm coming down south. The Cajun Country Paracon is taking place March 23rd from 9 a.m. till 4 p.m. Shane Pittman from the Holzer Files and me, Dave Schrader, will both be there and on hand. There's also Sarah Lemos. Uh, there is Jeremy Leonard, the Cajun demonologist. Uh, gosh, so many different great guests are going to be on hand for that weekend. And I would love for you to join us and be a part of this. You can get information by going to Facebook, Louisiana Spirits. You can find it, Facebook, Louisiana Spirits, or just go to darknessevents.com. Darknessevents.com. That's coming up March 23rd, 2024. If you'd like to come on out to Minnesota and spend a weekend shifting the paranormal with me and graveyard shift leader, Dalen Spratt, we'd love to have you for the weekend as we investigate claims of the paranormal at the Palmer House. Not only will we ghost hunt and investigate within the Palmer House, we'll also be going out on a few field trips to visit a few local haunts that you may find compelling. And we'll let Dalen do his best to communicate with the other side. Shifting the paranormal, that's April 19th through the 21st at the Palmer House and Sox Center 
Minnesota. And then the haunted Shanley Hotel in Napanock, New York, one of my absolute favorite locations last year. I finally got to go to the Shanley and it lived up to every expectation. What an amazing haunt. I'm back with Scotty the Medium. Scotty Davis will be there and uh, we're doing meet and greets. There's going to be a gallery reading, presentations, overnight accommodations, paranormal investigations, and more. I know that there are only a few of the full event tickets, but there are the meet and greet and presentation tickets. So if you're in that area and you'd like to come on out and meet us and get a chance to say hi, maybe even buy a copy of my book, uh, get a reading from Scotty, you can join us there. And Hillview Manor is bringing me back this year for May 11th. We'll be going back out to Hillview Manor, one of the most haunted buildings I had a chance to investigate last year as well. So many EVPs, so many spirits crying out to be heard. From the other side and then Paris Icon as I return that's right I think it's my fourth time going back to Mansfield Reformatory for Paris Icon 5 I'll be one of the special guests this year along with many other amazing speakers and that's May 17th through the 19th at Ohio State Reformatory in Mansfield Ohio this is one you should definitely make because if you have never been to Mansfield Reformatory this is one of the most haunted prisons that you'll ever get a chance to investigate and be a part of. And then join me out in Oregon for the Oregon Bigfoot Festival and beyond. Ronnie LeBlanc from Expedition Bigfoot will be there. I will be the paranormal contingent. There'll be other fascinating and interesting guests on hand for a weekend of conversations on everything from Bigfoot to ghosts. UFOs and beyond. That's June 29th in Portland, Oregon. And again, tickets for all of these amazing events can be found right at darknessevents.com. How about the Magical History Weekend at the Piper's Opera House in Virginia City, Nevada? You've seen Virginia City on just about every paranormal show under the sun. This is your chance to come on out and hear from Dustin Perry, the queen of Nevada ghosts. Janice Oberding is going to be there. I'll be on hand. So many other great guests. We'd love for you to join us. Again, tickets for this event and all others can be found right on our website at darknessevents.com. Okay, we are back. Gemma Jade is with us this evening. Let's dig into some more creepy stories featured in Midnight Visitors, True Stories of Black-Eyed Kids. That's the new book. It's the second part of her book. She came out with about a month, month and a half ago, which was more of the research-based, researching the folklore, the histories, the stories of these. These are the true encounters that people have relayed, uh, talking about the Black-Eyed Kids. Um have you ever come across somebody who has shared a story about letting them in? And if so, what have you, uh, what have you heard happened? Well, I do believe last time I was on, I told the story about the mom. She had run really quickly. She left her 10 year old son in the car. She pulled over, left the car running, went inside of Bodega, grabbed milk bread, ran back into the car. When she looked in the rearview mirror, she was kind of on autopilot. Her son was old enough to sit there for four minutes. She did it all the time. She looked in the rearview mirror and there was a black eyed kid, a random child with black eyes with its arm around her son. She flipped. She grabbed her son out of that car so fast, left the doors open, ran back in. She was so terrified and like even a little confused. So she couldn't really explain. The guy behind the counter inside of the store thought someone was trying to break into her car. So anyway, um, because I told it, I'll give you the very short version. She ended up calling her husband. And she said, look, I will explain when we get home, but I I'm not getting back in the car. You come drive my car home. I'll drive yours and we'll discuss it. So he says, oh, okay, this is weird, but fine. He, they make it home. The, the woman and her son make it home and the father does not make it home. He ends up in the hospital. He got into a car wreck on the way home and said that the last thing he remembered was a very foul stench and being very dizzy. And then that was it. He woke up in the hospital. He must've crashed the car. Now, the father ended up being perfectly fine, but for, a, I think it was even 18 months, this boy was sick. And I've heard this across the board with people who have claimed to have let these things in their home. Okay. Where, 
okay, first they thought he had the flu. So they start treating him for that. No, he has the measles. They start treating him for the measles. Now he has something with his kidneys. Then he has Crohn's disease. Every time they start to treat one thing, it would turn into a completely different thing. And they thought he was going to pass. It went on for so long. Finally, the parents said, we need to get back to our religion. And they decided it would be the best thing to have a prayer session over the boy at the church. They brought the boy into the church and they had the whole congregate, congregation praying over him. And immediately, everything was better. No more sickness, no more illnesses. And when the mother said, honey, did you know that boy? Like, how did he, how did he get into our car? Because, you know, they have to be invited. She didn't know that, but I was thinking it too. And the kid said, he just asked me if I wanted to be friends and if I, he can come to our house. So I said, yeah, you know, kids are so pure in that way. And also there's an elder, there's a story circulating the internet that I wasn't sure if I believed in it or not. And I couldn't personally verify it. So I put in the book, I was unsure about it, but it is in there where this elderly couple in the middle of a blizzard, get a knock at the door. They live, I think it was in Virginia, but it, they lived kind of like in the middle of nowhere. There were Mennonite children. So at first they thought it was Mennonite children before they saw the eyes and it's blizzarding out. The kids look alone. The woman said, sure, come on in. I'll make you some hot chocolate. So they're like, we need to call our mother. We're, we're trapped out here. So she's like, let me get them inside so that I can ask them, what are you doing here? Where'd you come from? She knew that, that the kids didn't live on the block. She had never seen them before. Her husband, also an elderly gentleman, was sitting on the couch the whole time, and he was very uncomfortable with the children from the moment they came in. It was a little bit darker in the house. She flicked a light on. She saw their eyes. She tried not to react. So she gives them the hot chocolate. They both kind of look at it. They put it down. And the spokesman, I call the, there's only one that speaks, no matter how many there are. So the spokesman said, my brother needs to use your bathroom. And she went to say it's right down the hall. And before she could even say that, they started walking directly to the bathroom. The next thing you know, the power goes out, lights flickering on and off, something out of a horror movie. She turns and looks down the hallway. They're both staring at her. The one cat, she had three or four cats. One cat was just hissing and growling and mewling at these kids the whole time before finally it turned and ran and hid. So the kids are, the, and, and the kids are standing at the end of the hallway and she's just staring. She doesn't know what to do. And the kids are like, the kid goes, our parents are here now. And they just walk from the edge of the hallway where the bathroom was. Never went into the bathroom, just stood there, turned around and stared at, at this woman. They leave. There's a lot of encounters like this, too, where a sleek looking black 1950s styled vehicle with tinted windows will pull up no matter where you are in the world and pick these kids up every once in a while. The husband gets up so quick to close the door behind them. The woman's looking out the window and she sees uh, what I would describe as a woman in black. And I cover them a lot on my channel, um, opening the back door for the kids to get in. But the the husband said he felt like the woman was knew that he was watching her because the way she was just staring back. Black sunglasses, even though it was, you know, two o'clock in the morning in a snowstorm. And by the time he turned around to look at his wife, he turned back. The car was gone. There were no tracks in the road, nor were there any footprints from the kids. Now, a skeptic would say maybe it was snowing so hard that they were covered up because they were in the house for about 10 minutes. The husband immediately starts getting nosebleeds. Same thing. They bring him to the doctor. He's got to go see a specialist. It's this. No, it's not. It's that. It's this. It's that. Depending on which account you read, and this is why I wanted to verify it, he either died of a brain tumor or was diagnosed with cancer and survived. The mm. cat, three cats were never seen again. Even though they weren't even out with the kids that night, like they were in room, they were over somewhere in the house. And the woman hadn't seen the other cats. They went missing the very next day and were never seen again. And the cat that was hissing and growling at the black eyed kids. Um, they found the cat deceased in a puddle of its own blood. And the vet said it had hemorrhaged from the inside out. And they couldn't understand why it was like an outside force and an inside force hitting, like coming together inside of the cat. And it just kind of exploded it unfortunately. Um, All right. Those are, are the two I've heard of people letting them in. Are you ready for another? Let's break this down into a possibility. Let's another do concept. It. All right. So we talked a few weeks ago on the show about angels and about what the concept of a real angel would look like. 
And many people, of course, are going to think of the long flowing hair, the beautiful white gowns, the gorgeous, you know, flailed out wings. Uh, when in reality, most angels are going to appear rather frightening, a little bit more broken and abused because they've been on the front line battling for us for so long. So what if the sense of dread that we feel when we encounter these beings is not associated to the beings? Maybe they are to look terrifying for a reason that's more protective in nature. What if these beings are being sent to people that are being targeted, right? Now, this sounds like a Stephen King book to me, but the concept that the three cats that were there suddenly vanish, the one cat who doesn't like the the two beings, it, you know, implodes from within after these children leave. What if their job was to come erase or get rid of the cancer, the evil that had permeated into this home? And these beings are trying to get in, trying to help without us knowing it. And of course, because of their look, they're going to seem frightening to us. But maybe the concept is we send in the most horrific. For people that don't know this concept, uh, that's why we put gargoyles on buildings. That's yes. why we put terrifying things is to frighten and be an affront to the, the fallen angels because they're still of the mind that they are perfection. And they don't want to cast their eyes upon something so unholy and so disgusting looking, right? Um, so what if this what if these are the the beings of of light that are actually there to protect us? I just don't I mean, it is possible. I don't think anything's really impossible for me. That would be such a huge stretch. But I do know, being a medium, that and I tell this to my clients all the time, you have to invite your guides, your team, your ancestors, your deceased loved ones, your angels, you have to invite them in to help you. They may want to be sitting on the sidelines like, oh, make that decision. If you do not ask for their help, they cannot help you. So the asking in, the inviting in fits with that. And I think any well thought out or even spontaneous at this point theory is better than sitting around pretending like these things don't exist. I don't ever understand people. And it's not a judgment. I just don't understand. I wish, sometimes I wish I can go through life not knowing the things that I know. But then there are other times where I'm like, I, I, I gotta know. Like I, I need, I need to know all of the things, you know? I don't believe they're angelic personally. I mm -hmm. do know angels are terrifying though. Um, they are... <laughs> They're very terrifying, but I just believe this is something, if I had to choose, interdimensional and very lower vibrational. The popping noises, I have an encounter with the pops. People keep saying they're hearing it popping um, before and after a visit. Very have you heard weird. that one yet? Yeah, a little bit. I We've talked about it with EVP and with some other activity where there's like this crackling or, or an electric discharge or oh yeah you and i had discussed that yeah right so so that is something but uh let's let's get into that a little bit more talk about some more of the experiences right after this in winter's grasp a chilling tale unfolds wanted magazines issue 40 secrets to be told al capone's ghost in shadows it creeps a spectral mobster where darkness seeps. Fourteen signs of a poltergeist's might, haunting whispers in the silent night. Pascagoula UFO, fifty years gone by. A cosmic encounter, reaching the sky. A ghost train of Tate Bridge, echoes in the mist. A phantom journey, where souls exist. Wanted Magazine Issue 40 is out now. Available from selected outlets and bit.ly forward slash haunted magazine. Don't be normal, be paranormal.
Yeah. All right. Gemma Jade's here with us. Midnight visitors, true stories of black eyed kids. Now, before you start sending me hate mail about David, obviously you're a, a member of the demonic realm because you're trying <laughs> to perpetrate stories of shenanigans. I'm just throwing out concepts. I'm throwing out ideas, man. We got to talk. We got to get the juices going. Yeah. What if some people are offended by the fact that I would even equate these creatures with something angelic. We just don't that's know. Part of the enigma, right? We don't know. And I don't think we should throw any decision out without considering many different aspects of these beings and what they could be as well. Uh, obviously, we've talked in the past about alien human hybrids. We've talked about the soulless. Uh, you know, that was another aspect of it children that were born without souls. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and, and there's, I, I I don't want to get into the depth of that because it's some dark stuff that, you know, can trigger a lot of people, but there are yeah. children that are born, um, uh, still born and things. And that these are the souls that once inhabited them that are now walking the earth. Uh, so there's a lot of bizarre, creepy, uh, you know, elements to this. And I'm going to check while you're telling the next story. I, if you guys have a theory on what it is, ghosts, interdimensional cryptids, aliens, human hybrids, uh, whatever. Tell me what your thoughts are. I'll pop them up on the screen as Gemma Jade tells us another strange tale of black yeah. eyed kid encounters. All right, Gemma, what have you got for us next? Okay. So this one I enjoy telling because I've been saying for a really long time that if they're not interdimensional, how are a bunch of kids surviving? I guess if they're supernatural, there are ways, but it just, I don't know this. So I've been seeing this. I can't say a lot, but I would say I have about eight encounters of this same scenario. So um, this guy was, he wasn't a truck driver, but I've been getting a lot from truck drivers like cross country in the United States and the UK. So this guy is going on a road trip from one part of the United States to another, and it's going to take him several days. He's driving, he's going slow, he's stopping to camp, he's got the RV, and he pulls into like middle of nowhere, Midwest, barely on the map town, and stops into this little dive bar, figuring he could park in the parking lot, sleep it off, he wants to have a good time, he's like running from something, I guess, is what he said. Um, and he meets this very attractive woman. Now she approaches him immediately. And this is a very little dive bar. There's not that many women in there. The ones that are in there aren't very attractive. This woman is stunning, he said. But as soon as she approached him, he smelled like the women in black smell. I don't know if y'all are familiar with that, but like the formaldehyde kind of death smell. So he was turned off, but she was beautiful and he was drinking. So she was buying him drinks. And the next <laughs> God, we are a pathetic young, breed, man, aren't we? Doesn't she smell so bad. Man, she's hot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, give me another beer. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So she's kind of plying him with alcohol. And at the end of the night, she invites him home. So as he they're driving to his home or her home, which is in the middle of nowhere. It took like an hour from the little tavern they were in to her house. And she lives in the woods. He said he was basically almost sobered up by the time he got there. That's how long it took. And she didn't speak to him the entire time. He tried to make conversation. He felt like he was like on the other end of a serial killer, a female serial killer. He said he started to really panic, but he didn't know where he was. He's uh, hundreds of or thousands of miles away from home. So he goes, goes with her and they get out in the middle of nowhere in this tiny little kind of ramshackle cabin. He goes in, they end up doing what they're, what they do and uh, still sleeps with her, by the way, um, even after of the course. serial killer vibes and the stench, <laughs> but uh, you know, it is what it is not yeah. judging. We've all yeah. woken up with that like lagoon creature next to us. You know what I'm saying? But um, <laughs> no. So he wakes up the next day early and he's like, I'm going to see if I can get like a cab out of here. She promises to drive him back to the RV. He tries to wake her up. She tells him, um, you know, I'll be out in a minute. Um, just go wait for me out front and don't make any noise. So he's thinking, oh, my gosh, maybe she has a kid or something. He goes into the kitchen to get a cup of water and like eight little between the ages of three 
and eight or 10 years old black eyed kids come out of like these other rooms. There's like three or four other rooms, small rooms, and they're standing in the kitchen, all just staring at him. It's like seven o'clock in the morning. He's hungover, probably a little regretful. And he said he didn't know what to do. And he was just like, you know, ha have a nice day. And he goes to leave. They start going like they're going to block the door until the woman comes out and snaps her fingers. They all flee. She gives him a dirty look and drives him back wordlessly and silently to the RV. Doesn't say anything to him. Doesn't say goodbye. Speeds off. This made me wonder. It sounds a little bit like a ridiculous encounter. And when I first heard this one, I was like, I'll put it on the probably not going to put it in the book pile. But then I started getting more from truck drivers who were going on one night stands with beautiful women who smelled kind of funky. Um, the other smells like mud and grass, um, overwhelming, you know, and waking up to a, a house full of black eyed kids. And it makes me wonder, do they have keepers? I've seen cars that are associated with the men and women in black and men and women in black picking these kids up from places or these kids getting into those kinds of cars with those kinds of people, okay, many times. So are they being handled? And if so, for what? You know, they're they're collecting energy, fear energy, right? Mm. What are they doing? They're living off of it. But what then, you know, and, and what does this regular looking woman get out of it? Or was she? Was she a woman in black? Was she a black eyed adult? Did she have contact? You know, it just made my mind kind of spin when I started hearing all these truckers and cross country drivers saying that they were waking up to houses full of these children after going home with the same specific type of woman. Music says, could they be cryptids? Well, in a sense, right? They're there. They could be anything. Of, yeah, I don't know what. Yeah, cryptids are these creatures that are just not categorized quite yet. So, good God. Uh, so, Sandra says, when did these sightings begin? Like we brought up in the very first segment, um, the main one with Brian Bethel became it became famous in the 90s. Uh, but so did the advent of kind of online blogging and all of this. However, since I know starting my show 18 years ago, um, we started first we were introduced to the 90s and the early 2000s stories then we started rolling back and i started getting stories from families and people all over the united states and around the world that had encounters going back into the 40s and 50s uh i think that's about as early ancient, back yeah. ancient civilizations built statues of small children with pure obsidian eyes in the middle of their towns or in the woods and i haven't found any encounters with black eyed children, but I I'll speak briefly about Octar. You know, um, it's an old Iroquois legend about the children who would live, you know, with the tribes and they'd go off in the woods to play and they'd come out a day or two later. Everyone's looking for them. Nobody could find them. They're thought dead. They come out a day or two later. They are pale skinned, kind of fragile looking, big black eyes. The townspeople or the rest of the tribe are afraid of them. But the parents, of course, are like, no, my kid's sick. You know, let me take care of them. The next thing you know, the whole family that lives in the house is frail looking, pale, with big black eyes like obsidian. Then the whole village is overtaken and they move to the next village. And this is a real old Iroquois legend that I found. But the strange thing was in all of my research for years, I have only found about three paragraphs on that. And I've never found anything else. Even when I try to look up the legend, look up the word, I had to go to my mother, who is Native American, ask her if she had ever heard anything about it. She said yes, but she didn't really know the extent of the tale. I can't find even the original article anymore. It's the one article that I bookmarked. It says it doesn't exist anymore. And that makes me suspicious. I'm sorry. I am a suspicious right. person. Like who took all this information off the internet? So ancient civilizations did um, have encounters with some sort of black eyed child. It's just that it wasn't written about. Right. Just like the slender man, uh, you know, here we thought it was just this meme created this creature created for an internet contest. Uh, and then we find out later that actually there have been iterations of this being that have existed in multiple cultures. Uh, Ristol says, Gemma have black eyed kids gotten more human in the reports now compared to the past. Not as far as I'm aware I 
they haven't even started really, I guess, okay, I have come across more reports of them dressing similar to if there's a child in the home. So like I have a five-year-old son. If a BEK knocked, that five-year-old BEK would be wearing the same clothes as my son and be carrying my son's favorite stuffed animal. Like, don't you want to help me? I'm just like your son. As far as more human, no, they are still awkward and creepy and mechanical, robotic. They telepathically communicate right in front of your face. They don't ring doorbells when they're clearly there. They knock. No, I don't see them becoming more human-like. And I just don't like, I feel like there are so many entities that we are aware of that have overcome the eye situation, right? How many of them can appear to us without having to have these black eyes? These black eyes are the key to it. What is it that, because it, they know, they have to know, or whoever's overseeing them or in control of them has to know this is sinister, has to know this is what is going to put even the people who are they're like, okay, I'm going to put aside my dread. These are just two kids. I'll, I'll let them in. No way once you see those eyes. No way. So it has to be something that cannot be overcome. Now, no evil or demonic or lower vibrational being is supposed to be able to perfectly be able to copy the visage of a human without some mark or scar somewhere. Mm -hmm. But even the demonic, when posing as small children, don't have all black eyes unless they're revealing themselves to be demonic. I've never heard of a kid saying there's, you know, a, a little, a little kid in my room and they've got all black eyes that I'm playing with. No, it's only when someone knows that it's a demon and it finally decides to reveal itself as such that the black eyes come out. And I have heard many stories of black eyed adults. Are they growing up or are these the overseers or are these a different thing? I, it's so much. Well, then that's a good place for us to leave this hanging. But Dave, she just got started. Last time you only had her on for a half an hour. This time we had her on for an hour. Who knows? Maybe next time, 90 minutes as we continue I'm to in. talk. Black-eyed kids, black-eyed adults. And we should start to cross culture with the white-eyed children. Oh, uh, I'd love that. Is, I have lots of encounters. Yeah, that's a creepy encounter. What, do, you, do you know one off the top of your head you could riddle off so people have a little uh, taste? Okay, so the one that I said last time is the one off the top of my head. A guy had okay. a black-eyed kid knock on his door. There were two of them, two black-eyed kids, and they would not go away. And this was Midwestern United States. After the whole thing played out like normal, BEK, let us in. You've got to let us in. The kid's getting angry. It wouldn't let him. The BEK would not let him close his door. It kept putting its foot, right? Not necessarily stepping in, but stopping it. So he turns and he's like, I'm getting my gun. He gets his gun. He comes back. He's got it aimed at the door. He hears something in his head that's like, lower your weapon. He lowers the thing. He's like hypnotized, mechanical. There is a white-eyed teenager standing at the door. No BEK anywhere. And the white-eyed teenager says, where did they go? And he says, I don't know, but I was about to shoot at them. I, I don't know. And the white-eyed teenager just gets like a pensive look and looks him straight in the eyes and says, you won't ever be seeing them again. And walks off. By the time he gets to the door to look out the window in the door, everyone's gone. There's nobody on the street. Midnight Visitors, True Stories of Black-Eyed Kids. That's the new book out and available by Gemma Jade right now. There's a link on tonight's program guide. And I've been hearing great things about the first book we spoke about a month and a month and a half ago. I'm glad that you're able to fit us in and come back and share a little longer time with us this time. So thank you for being here, Gemma. Thank you so much for having me, Dave. You're a rock star. I appreciate you. And thank you all for tuning in and spending a little time here with us. For those of you watching live, thanks for coming in a little late and staying late with us. What are these beings? What is going on in the world around us? Is there a magic that's breathed into life when enough people begin to speak about something? Or do they exist all the time? And now that we're beginning to recognize them, people are feeling more secure to come forward and speak about these type of beings. It's almost impossible to say it this point to what type of experiences we're really having but this i can be sure of there is something strange something unusual in the world around us and if you're not too careful you might just have an experience yourself but now that you've listened to programs like this maybe the darkness will be just a little bit more light with the information that we share here keep those doors closed keep the chain across the doors if you're brave enough to open it up and look into the eyes of the child knocking on the other side of your door asking to use your phone 
And if you're anything like me, you'll just keep that door shut and go back in and turn on the Paranormal 60 podcast and listen to that. Or sit in and rest down with a nice book to keep you company for the night. Like, you know, Theater of the Mind, Tales from the Darkness by Dave Schrader, available now. You can get signed copies and standard copies at my website, paranormal60.com. Thank you for making me part of your week. We'll be back Wednesday with the Paranormal 60 News crew and a whole bunch of strange things and concepts to discuss. But I want to hear from you. Email me your thoughts and theories on the Black Eyed Children phenomena and what you think. And if you could put it into a paragraph or two, of what you believe is really going on. Love to hear from you. And if you have had an experience with a black eyed kid, make sure to write and share it with me. And we'll share it here on the program on an upcoming episode in our mailbag of the macabre. When we go in and read your stories, your questions right here on the paranormal 60, I'm Dave Schrader. Thank you for spending your evening here and we'll see you again Wednesday night with the paranormal 60 news. in we want to buy a copy of theater of the mind tales from the darkness only on paranormal60.com kids so you can go away and access it from your smart devices or just ask your friend hey alexa order me a copy of theater of the mind tales from the darkness right now